We have Luke chapter 2, verse 40, verse 21 through 40. Are you ready? Yeah. Yes. Oh, let's just, this is wait for the Holy Spirit. Okay. And then we'll just read this thing. Verse 21, and when eight days had passed before his circumcision, his, his name was then called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days for their purification according to the law of Moses was completed, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. That's for each firstborn male. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then he took him into his arms and blessed God and said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. He's saying... Now I can die because I have seen your promise come true in Jesus. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And his father and mother were amazed at these things which were being said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel. And for a sign to be opposed, and a sword will pierce even your own soul to the end to, to the end that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. In other words, a sword will pierce your soul so that many will be able to find him. And there was a prophetess Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years and had lived with her husband even seven years after her marriage and then as a widow to the age of 84 she never left the temple serving night and day with fasting and prayers at that very moment she came up and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak of him to all of those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord they returned to Galilee to their own city of Nazareth and the child continued to grow and become strong Increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. <sighs> Last week, I mean, this is this is what this is the script. You know, just a great story, and it, it speaks for itself. You don't need to explain what it's all about. Um, they're bringing Jesus to be circumcised. And when I, sometimes I tell the story, Jesus even in, came as a baby. Last week, I, I made a big deal. The love of God that He would be born a baby. And that he would endure all of the, you know, all of the, you know, diapers, all of the feeding, just the human beings leading him by the hand. And in this case, suffering, circum even Jesus even suffered circumcision so that he could say that he had lived like they had lived wow. or like you have lived. And that he has suffered every temptation. He has, he has been put to the test in every way. And he did that. So... Anyway, so we have Simeon, this man, lives to be an old man by the promise that you will see the redemption of Israel. You'll meet your Redeemer. He will come. And he sees Jesus and he says, now I can die for I have met my Redeemer. I have seen the salvation of Israel, of Jerusalem. And Anna, who lives with her husband for seven years after being married, probably married very young, 13 to 16. So she may be 24 when he dies. She goes and lives in the temple, and she's 84 in the story. So minimum of 60 years, she doesn't leave the temple, but prays day and night that she might meet and have the Redeemer of Israel, that God's promise would be fulfilled, and she prays and fasts. And what, lives on crumbs from the sacrifices? I don't know. But she's in this temple, and it says she never left for 60 years, praying that the Redeemer would come. 
Simeon, it says the spirit was upon him. Now, Elizabeth and Zechariah, it said they, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Mary was filled with the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit. Simeon, the Holy Spirit was on him, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And there's this difference. We've been talking about the filling of the Holy Spirit a lot lately because those phrases are in those stories. What this means to them, how rare that is, and for you and I, how incredibly common it is. Every single person who wants to believe that they are saved must be filled with the Holy Spirit. For you must be perfect as He is perfect. And how would you be perfect as He is perfect unless He cleanses the temple? I certainly can't cleanse my own temple any more than the Pharisees. But I can submit. My temple is clean because I submitted to him cleaning my temple. In their temple, he threw over the money tables. He chased them around with whips. He cursed them for being, for being thieves and robbers. He called them a brood of vipers and, and a den of thieves. Me? He didn't do that. Sometimes it really did hurt, almost like Mary. A soul, a, a, a sword will pierce your soul to the end that many hearts may be revealed. I can't say I've ever had anything like a sword piercing my soul, but I have had great pain, and I have known many people that could say they had swords pierced their soul so that many could believe. I have seen it over and over in my life where people's souls were pierced and others could believe by watching their faith. When I went through something simple like a house burning down, people said, it's so encouraging to see how you go through hardship. My attitude was, you think burning a house down is hardship. You should see a, a, a young mother of four losing her husband or a young couple losing their daughter over three or four years of, of, of suffering. You should see real trouble, real piercings of souls. And I know for a fact others believe because of the way these people walk through with their faith. That's right. Because they were temples of the living God and the Holy Spirit wasn't just upon them. Wow. I pray all the time with people who are, they have obviously no desire to be completely controlled by the Lord. They struggle so much with turning over control. This posture of surrender is like for them just a sign. They do it so you think they've surrendered, but then when it gets to their heart, they just cannot surrender their soul to Him. It's just so hard to trust. It's so hard to trust. And I got to tell you, the Holy Spirit does touch them just like it did Him. But the difference between salvation and not salvation, between a man living the law and hoping that the Redeemer comes and saying, I can die now because I've seen the Redeemer, is that the Holy Spirit goes with him. The Holy Spirit is around him. The Holy Spirit is on him sometimes. But that difference for you and me is the Holy Spirit comes to make his home in us. Know you not, we're the temple of the living God. He lives in us. He acts in us. Where we go, he goes. What we touch, he touches. What we say is supposed to be what he says. And I guarantee you, we're not that perfect at it. So what's the evidence that the Holy Spirit is in you? This, there's got to be evidence, right? Yep. So, so, so one of them is the fruit of our lives. So, you know, the, the feelings and experience we have. Most of it's an awareness that the Holy Spirit lives inside of you and this miracle of Him speaking through you that sometimes you touch things, you feel His power coming through you. And I pray in large circles, I pray in small circles, I pray with people that are totally immoral, I pray with people that don't want to be Christians but are just there in case He can help them through their crisis. And they feel the Holy Spirit. 100% of them feel the Holy Spirit. And I like that. That's good. He didn't reject them. And I always point that out to him. You felt him and he did not reject you. But are you ready to open your heart? Are you ready to surrender your life? You see, I don't think too many people are teaching that you have to give your life up. I'm owed nothing. I gave my life up and I'm owed nothing by him. I deserve. The truth is I know me and I deserve nothing. He owes me nothing. I deserve nothing. I owe him everything. And he lets me be used by him. He lets me go for him, speak for him. And I have this miraculous thing that happens when I speak. And I see a sword, but it doesn't pierce my soul. 
What it does is it divides truth from lies. It's the Word of God coming out of me. It's Jesus. He is the Lamb of God. He's the bread that came down from heaven, and He is the Word that became flesh and dwelt among us and even suffered circumcision. And when these people encountered Him, Anna, so devoted, so devoted, 60 years of serving the Lord in the temple, Simeon, waiting patiently as an old man, all his life he's waited for this Jesus to come. And when they encounter Jesus, they recognize him. Wow. Simeon says, I want to die. I'm, I'm, I'm free to die. I'm happy to die now. My soul is satisfied. I have met him. He only met a baby. Just think if he'd have met the adult Jesus who was healing the blind and raising the dead and preaching the kingdom and teaching the truth and actually embodying the truth and the way and the life. Boy, you know, guess who gets to meet him like that? You and me. That's right. All the other people later in the Bible, they get to meet him as this adult preaching the truth, this, this presence of God on the face of the earth, this Emmanuel. But these guys met him as a baby, and it transformed them. They proclaimed it. They sung songs. They, they quoted Bible. They were, they were remembered forever by, the, by Luke writing this down. That's right. They were honored for what they did. The, so when Jesus comes upon you, when you come encounter with him, all these people I told you to pray for, and I, they feel, so, oh, wow, that was awesome. It was like fire when you touched me. It was like, the, you know, they just describe different things. I don't want to try to, or in any way, mock what they're saying. I, I, they, they absolutely have real experiences. But it's touching them. Wow, not coming out of them. Not filling them. Wow. Not cleansing them. And the most wonderful part of that, that's really good for you. That's really good for all of us. But the truth is, he didn't reject you. So would you come a little further? He didn't turn you down. He touched you. The Spirit surrounded you, came upon you. Would you come a little further? You'll surrender with your hands here. I'll surrender here, but don't ask me to do this. It's vulnerable. Okay, well, you did this. Would you do it a little more? Could you come a little further? Surrender a little more? Give your life into his kingdom? Let him, let him take you over? How did people uh, reveal himself to people? How did Jesus reveal himself to people? Well, with Elizabeth, it was John jumped in her belly when she came into the house, Mary with the, Jesus in the belly. She encountered Jesus in Mary's belly. And John, her baby, jumped for joy because his Messiah was near. Mary and Joseph, an angel told them. And then the events of their life, it says they marveled at these things. The shepherds in the fields, angels told them, you will find wrapped in swaddling clothes. And he told, they told them what they would find your king, the hope of good news for the whole world. They, they encountered him because they followed an angel. Wise men followed stars to a star that led him to this. And they were looking for a great king on the face of the earth. And they found out that he was Emmanuel, God with us, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. The crowds found him by the teaching, the signs, the wonders, the miracles. And they recognized him. And still they rejected him in high percentage rejected him because he didn't look like what they thought he should look like. But many followed him because they don't care what he looks like. They know he is the way, the truth, and the life. And the disciples found him. They encountered Jesus when he came out to their fishing boat and said, follow me. Came to the tax table and said, follow me. And they we're, we're on the precipice. What are they going to do? Well, they dropped their nets and they followed him. They made a choice to make him more important than their, their living. For John and James, it was leaving their father's business. For the rest of them, it was leaving their livelihood. For the tax collector, Levi, Matthew, it was leaving riches, power, influence. But they had to get up 
and follow him. And that's how they encountered Jesus, was they obeyed his call to follow me. I must say that's how I did it. The priests in the temple came face to face with Jesus through his teaching. They said, the priest said, how does he have such wisdom and understanding? How does a 12-year-old know the scriptures like this? It's how people encounter Jesus in so many different ways. I encountered Jesus. I started out as a child in a church. I was, in our church, children go to church with the parents. We all sit in a row in pews. And, and everything from the minute you hit the door, the door is built ornate because it's God's house. The, the hallways and the, everything is ornate and holy and overblown because it's God's house. And you, you, have to, you have to follow an exact protocol and dip your finger on a sponge and bow your knee when you pass the altar. And when you enter the place and leave the place, you have to do the sign of the cross in reverence of the cross of Jesus. And when you sit there, you can't talk. You cannot converse, or it's a sin. And you have taught all these things about mortal sin and venial sin. And you, they, if you go up there, they'll put a wafer in your mouth. And if it touches your teeth, it's a sin. And it's just like, oh my gosh, there's so much, and it's so reverent, it's so holy, and you have to follow. And it's like, he gads if you do anything wrong. But then you leave the building. And all of a sudden, nobody's holy. And you live your life amongst the very same people you were in church there. It's a crowd of family. It's a crowd of community. You live in the town. You know them all. You go to school with everybody that was there in the building. More than half of the class goes to that church. We have a catechism on Saturday where they teach us all these rules and regulations. And they say they make it real clear that you got to be perfect to go to heaven. And then you go home and you realize I can't be perfect. So therefore I can't go to heaven. What am I going to do? And I sat in that church, and I, uh, they had a cross that wasn't like that cross. It was a cross with Jesus on it. And that cross showed the nails and showed the dripping blood. And the head showed the thorns and showed the blood dripping, showed the spear hole, showed the, oh, I mean, the agony on his face. And I saw it every single week of my life. Some days I'd see it, some year, weeks I'd see it twice. But I'd sit there and look at that cross. And I'd be so confused, what's going on? I don't understand why murder had to happen. During the service, they would read these readings from the Gospels, and it's always a good story about Jesus, where he healed a leper, or, or he blind, or he did something good, or he said something good. And it's this good, 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 and I mean, don't you just love him? And then you look over there and go, what? I'm a child. I can't get it. I don't understand. You got to be perfect to go to heaven. There's no way I can. And then we leave the room and none of them are trying to be perfect. Nobody's trying to live right. Nobody's living what they said. And I just got angry, really angry. Right. I stormed out the door and said, forget this. Right. If you guys don't believe it, why are you trying to sell me on it? But one thing stuck with me. What was that about? Right. For God so loved the world. That was love. You did that to your son. And then you're going to send me to hell because I want to be right. I just can't be. I don't seem to be able to be. So I had three prayers in my life. And I, I never gave him credit until later. I forgot all about it. I had an older brother that was just ripe for Vietnam, and Vietnam was raging, and they were pulling numbers of birthdays, and his birthday came up early, and so he's definitely getting drafted. He's definitely going to Vietnam, and I'm just going to tell you, my brother would be dead. He's, he's a bit, you know, Forrest Gump is just a Hollywood movie. People like Forrest Gump go to Vietnam, they get dead. So I knew my brother was doomed, and nobody cared that he couldn't handle those kind of things, and I just prayed. I loved him, and I just prayed. Oh, constantly. Don't let my brother go to Vietnam. I never had a prayer answered, so I didn't know. But my parents are fighting like crazy. They're like screaming at each other, and they're screaming, I want a divorce, and they're planning for me to live with her and the others to live with him, and they're going to live over there, and who's going to sell the house? And I mean, it's just this plan going on, man. And so I'm praying, oh, I mean, just my whole world's falling apart, and I'm just, please don't let my parents get a divorce. And my third prayer as a child was, isn't there some way you can make it so I can go to heaven? Well, my brother didn't go to Vietnam, and he shouldn't have got student deferments, and he just miraculously got them all the time. And his number called, but he was deferred, so he didn't go to Vietnam. 
Vietnam ended just before I had to go. And my mom and dad didn't get divorced. He died just recent, uh, a couple years ago at 88. I've been, been married to my mom for 68 years. They didn't get a divorce. And number three, he showed me the way that I could go to heaven. The way that I could go to heaven is to encounter Jesus, not just from a belief standard or from afar, or have the Holy Spirit touch me and say, oh, that feels good, but to surrender my life to Jesus. My first book I read the night I met him on March 10th, 1975, was Revelation. I've told that many times, but man, when I was done that night, and I'm telling you, the Christians around me were so panicked, I'm reading that book. And yet it, it, it was like the solidity. That, that settles it. I'm not having scorpions st- sting me for uh, 15 months or whatever that was. I'm not, I'm not getting stung like that. Uh, I'm, this, they're serious, and I'm going to stay serious. That's right. And that set me on a course that I was never going to turn back from. And in 46 years, I've never turned back. And I don't follow out of fear. I just, he made a way for me to go to heaven. Amen. My brother didn't go to Vietnam, and my parents never got divorced. And I only had three prayers, and I realized you were with me the whole time. Sitting in that pew as a child, he was encountering me. He was saying, I got you. I'm going to show you the way. Just like he said to Mary, a a sword is going to pierce your soul. Like he said to Paul, I'm going to show you what you must suffer for my name's sake. He was saying to me, I got you. I'm going to get you through. And I don't know how he did it because I got so mad and so hateful. I got so, I was just such an angry young man. People had just betrayed me and I was done with people and hating people. And he pulled me out of that and made a way for me to go to heaven. I don't think it was to answer my prayer as a child, even though I'd like to think it was. I think it was his plan from the beginning. And I think that we sometimes forget the cross and how important it is for children and everyone to see what he went through. When you encounter Jesus, how do you know? Could it be angels? Could it be other people? Could it be just like the list I read? Mary, the shepherds, the wise men, the disciples, the crowd, the priest. Everyone's going to have a chance to encounter Jesus and what's your response going to be? And the only response that gets to heaven, I'm telling you, is a surrender. It's not a tattoo you put on you and you got the mark of the cross. You can wear bumper stickers all you want. You can attend church all you want. But until you surrender your life to him, until you decide to love him, I'll tell you the fruit of salvation that is most important. The one that I count on the most, the assurance of my salvation is this, that I guarantee I will love him every day of my life. If I love him, that's the fruit of my life, of him living in me. The Holy Spirit comes to help me love him. And the assurance of my salvation is that I love Jesus. I sat in that chair and listened to those stories, and I kept looking at the cross, and I didn't, I didn't understand love. But then later when I met him, I said, God so loved the world. Oh. For, and then I read later, for this is how we know he loves us. He sent Jesus to the cross. This is the love of the Father that He gave His Son or that He sent His Son to die on a cross. I went, oh, that's what this murder is all about. Loving us so that we can become the temple of the living God. So that we can walk in His Spirit. Not just following it. Not He, he really is out there and everywhere. He really is right here with me. But the true fruit of salvation is that he lives inside of me, that he makes his home in me, that he speaks through me, touches through me, loves through me. For this is the love of the Father, the cross. And anybody that would follow me, he says, anyone that come after me must first deny themselves, pick up their cross and follow me. And I got to just be calm. I just got to be honest with you. I really hope there's not a cross in my future. But whether there is or whether there isn't, I'm going. I'm with him. I don't want it, but I'm with him. And I pray that he'll give me the strength to endure whatever comes. A sword piercing my soul? I don't want it. But I pray with all my heart that I 
I will endure it. Because it's he who endures to the end will be saved. So we are filled with the Holy Spirit if we know him and if we have surrendered to him. And we can fill the Holy Spirit if we just believe in him and we just want to. He will touch us. Here I am. Will you surrender and let me in? Will you surrender and let me forgive you? Will you let me make a way for you to go to heaven when you die? Absolutely. Absolutely, I will. Will you? Will you join me in heaven for the rest of eternity? Will you join me here on earth as we seek to reveal the Lamb of God to the world? Have, let them have encounters. Help them come face to face with Jesus the way Anna did, the way, the way Simeon did, the way the disciples did, the way Mary and Elizabeth did. We have an encounter with Jesus where we decide, yes, I want to go to heaven. I want to follow you and I want you to take over my life. I surrender. Are you ready to do that? I pray you are. Thanks for watching the Father's House Orville YouTube channel, but don't stop there. We'd love you to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss a live service or a video. Help us spread the message of Jesus by sharing this video with your friends. You can also support the Father's House financially by clicking the give button. Thanks again for watching today and we hope to see you again soon.